Greetings and salutations, young true believers. So what are we talking about today? Well, we are beginning the section of the course on the philosophy of mind. And this all begins with Descartes. In addition to being a famous mathematician and philosopher, Rene Descartes was also a scientist. And you have to understand, uh, under Roman law, there's a long-standing prohibition that continued in the Middle Ages against dissecting bodies. So we knew very little about human anatomy, uh, at least internal anatomy, um, prior to the Renaissance. But after the Renaissance, this prohibition against dissection, against conducting autopsies, fell by the way, right? And Descartes begins participating in autopsies. He's participated in dozens of them. And the, the idea begins to, to worm its way into his brain that the human body is a lot like a flesh machine. It is a flesh machine. Uh, your lungs are like a bellows, your heart is a pump, etc. right? Now, when Descartes opens up the human skull and looks at the brain, it's roughly, you know, five pounds, three kilos, uh, divided into hemispheres, right? Right hemisphere, left hemisphere. Um, he does not see any structure in the human brain that he thinks is sufficiently complex. Now, there's an assumption there. Descartes assuming that whatever gives rise to language use and cognition, and, and by cognition he means specifically the ability to think mathematically, right? It has to be complex, and he doesn't see any structure in the human brain that he thinks is sufficiently complex to explain those two behaviors. Again, language use and cognition. So Descartes posits that there must be some immaterial aspect of human beings, um, what he calls a pure substance, right, as opposed to an impure substance like your body that can be divided. Your, the pure substance of your, your mind, right, your noose, um, it can't be divided and it's going to survive bodily death and it interacts with your physical brain and body. Um, Descartes, Barna, this is a misconception in history of philosophy, right, that Descartes just makes this up ad hoc, right? He doesn't. This was the received medical view going back a hundred years before Descartes was born, that the, the pineal gland, which is a pea-sized gland, it sits in the center of your brain. Uh, today we know it secretes melatonin and a few other hormones. Um, they didn't know what its purpose was in Descartes' day. Now, it's the only structure in your brain that's not divided into spheres, right, left to right. Um, and so Descartes, following the medical tradition of his day, contended that the, the pineal gland is the seat of the soul. This is where the immaterial mind or soul, if you will, interacts with the physical body. Uh, the activity of the mind while it's thinking inside the pineal gland causes the pineal gland to spin. And the pineal gland then secretes what were known at the time as animal spirits. The thought was that what traveled up and down your nerves were fluids, animal spirits, fluids, literally, right? And this is how uh, the nerves informed the brain of what was going on uh, in the external world. Today, obviously, we know that the process is chemical electrical. Uh, Descartes had no way of knowing that. But the question still remains, is there something to Descartes' view, which has come to be known as mind-body dualism, right? The idea that creatures like human beings and maybe some of the non-human animals, right, are composed of a physical body and an immaterial mind, right? Well, when pressed, just as a historical FYI, when pressed to, to, just, to, to explain this interaction further, right, between mind and body, Descartes argued, he used an analogy, it's, it's like a sailor in a ship, but more intimate than that, where, because uh, if the ship takes on physical damage, the sailor does not feel the damage of the ship, right? Whereas the mind does experience the damage that the body takes on, right? Um, it was also objected, hey, Descartes, what about people who are developmentally disabled, right? Um, and Descartes argued there, there's nothing wrong with their mind. The problem is their body, specifically their brain, is uh, underdeveloped or damaged and so the transmission from mind to brain is impeded right um, today the primary argument that proponents of uh, the mind-body uh, dualism view uh, the primary argument that they use in favor of their position is an argument 
for what's known as qualia. So, again, I perceive this package is red, and probably you do as well. Certainly you do. I perceive this highlighter as yellow, and doubtless you do too. The question is, is your experience of yellow identical to mine? Is your experience of the red identical to mine? Is your experience of, say, the scent of a rose identical to mine? Is your experience of the taste of, say, um, you know, sriracha hot sauce the same as mine? The point being that there's no way we could ever know, right? Um, our experiences cannot be radically different because, obviously, if we smell the same scent, we're, there's almost certainly going to be consent, uh, consensus that we're smelling a rose. Uh, there's going to be consensus that the color in front of us is red or yellow or what have you, right? But are these experiences identical? And can I know, you know, what your experience is like? Well, no, I cannot. I can make an analogy to your experience from my experience, right? So, if, for example, if you walk into a doctor's office, you'll see a chart with a, a variety of smiling and frowning faces, right? And the question is, how much pain are you in? Uh, with a smile meaning none and a frown, tears meaning intense pain, right? Um, that's because there is no way to objectively measure pain, right? And this is what uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein famously calls the beetle in the box problem. How do I know your pain is the same as mine? Well, the only thing I can do is gauge your behavior. Are you wincing? Are you, are you tearing up, right? Um, are you in shock, right? So uh, I can't have that direct one-to-one -one access to your brain, right? All I can do is make analogy to, to what I'm experiencing, right? And so this argument for quality is the strongest uh, argument in favor of mind-body dualism. It's a, it's a challenge that the materialist, the person who, like myself, argues there's only brain. There's no such thing as brain and mind. All our mental states, what we call mental states, are brain states, right? Um, it's a it's a tough it's a it's the toughest challenge right for the materialist to be able to deal with the fact of qualia right um, now one other thing consideration that she brought up when we're talking about the mind body debate is the question of what is consciousness right uh, it's we've come a long way in this debate uh, it used to be and by well, by a long way what I mean is uh, most of their all scientists, right, who engage in you know, study psychology and the human brain, right, neuro, uh, neuropsychology, they dismissed for decades any notion of consciousness. It's just it's a weird, ineffable thing that philosophers talk about. It probably doesn't even exist, right? Um, that has changed. Uh, philosophers like the English uh, philosopher and neuroscientist Daniel Seth, have, he has an active program at the University of Sussex examining the question of what is consciousness. Um, so a brief uh, definition, obviously, is in order here. Consciousness, as I understand it, and I think as most philosophers would describe it, is simply an awareness. An awareness of oneself as individuated and yet a part also of the larger external world, right? Um, to use a term from uh, uh, the, the Australian philo uh, philosopher David Chalmers, right? It's the movie in your head, right? Um, and while we now generally think, yes, obviously human beings are conscious, the question is, well, are various other life forms like, you know, dogs, cats, crows, octopi, worms, trees, are they conscious, right? Um, so th this is, uh, again, an area of philosophy that, that scientists have finally begun to take seriously. And um, again, we're going to talk about uh, through this chapter about how uh, brain can give rise to consciousness. And of course, if, if you're of a dualist bin, you're going to argue that brain is not sufficient to give rise to consciousness. Uh, you need mind.